Good morning, ladies. I've been given the thumbs up to start, so. Um, so thank you all for having me. Um, my topic today, I've been giving, I've been given the topic of flourishing as a disciple in a busy word. It was actually discipleship in a pretty word, but if you're like me, you kind of want to make things pretty or sound prettier. So I was like, flourishing as a disciple in a busy world sound fun to me. So that's what I want to say. So that's what I've called it. Um, so before we go ahead and get started, our text for today will be coming from Luke chapter 10, and we'll be looking at verses 38 through 42. Those will be, that will be our main text for today's lesson. So if you have your Bible, then you can go ahead and turn there, and we'll go ahead and get started. So we all know that sometimes life can get busier than we expect it to. There's school, there's homework, our social lives. You know, we try to keep it up as best we can, but it gets hard for all, for all of us sometimes. Um, so in our lesson today, the first thing I want us to do is I want us to do a brief character study on Jesus, Mary, and Martha, just very brief. And I want us to notice how they let their light shine while dealing with the everyday hustle of life. And then we will look at five practical tips that I believe will help all of us to flourish and be the best disciples of Christ um, we can while living in this busy world. So we'll go ahead and we'll, let's go ahead and read our text together. Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. First, I want us to look at Jesus, the busy Savior. So leading up to chapter 10 of our text, the previous chapters of Luke show us several of the miracles Jesus had already performed. His preaching, his teaching, and then right after Jesus' temptation in Luke 4, 1 through 12, he begins his ministry in verse 14. Um, that's of chapter 4. And then in verses 16 through 30, we read the account of Jesus in Nazareth going to teach in the synagogue only to be rejected by his people, and they attempt to throw him off a cliff. That's verse 29. And throughout verses 31 through 44 of chapter 4, we see him heal a man with an unclean spirit. He heals Peter's mother-in-law and others with various illnesses and diseases. Chapter 5, he calls his first disciple and cleanses a leper. And in chapter 6 through 9, we find Jesus doing more preaching, teaching parables, and performing many miracles. Now, yes, we know that Jesus came to earth to preach and teach, but during his ministry, you got to ask yourself, how did he make time to lounge at a friend's table? Luke 5, 29. Or answer questions about fasting in Luke 5, 33 through 39, when there were still several other miracles and teachings that had to be done. And furthermore, when it seemed as if the Savior did have a break from his busy ministry, he was awakened by his disciples who thought they were perishing on a boat in Luke 8, 22 through 25. Along the way, Jesus makes more time for some friends of his and gives a private lesson to Martha and her merry sister which we just read, Luke 10, 38 through 39. And although he was busy and always needed by someone, even our Savior understood what it was like to balance life and shine in a busy world. Secondly, let's look at studious Mary. So throughout the Bible, it was common to see someone sitting at a teacher's feet. Sitting at someone's feet can show the thought of having respect for the individual's teaching, or it can also be seen as a sign of devotion or worship towards the individual. First, uh, verse 39 of our text tells us that Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. 
we see this same posture in Luke 8, 35. After Jesus healed the demon-possessed man, he was seen sitting at the feet of Jesus and clothed in his right mind. And in Acts 22, and verse 3, when Paul states his credentials, he says that he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. We can also see Mary anointing the feet of Jesus with expensive perfume and wiping his feet with her hair in John 12, 3. And so as we've already noticed earlier, Jesus was well into his ministry by the time he makes it to Mary and Martha's home. And Luke 8, 1 through 3 tells us that he already had a following of women as well. Whether Mary fully understood what Jesus's ministry was all about or not, or if she even knew that he was the promised Messiah to come up until this point, what she did recognize was that he had great power and taught as one having authority, Matthew 7, 28 through 29. Mary knew there was something different about the man called Jesus and that she needed to be sitting at his feet every chance she got. Now, thirdly, let's look at Martha, overwhelmed Martha. So Martha, Mary's sister, knew there was something great about Jesus as well. Verse 38 of our text in Luke 10 tells us that Martha welcomed Jesus into her house. The word welcome in our text means she received him joyfully. And a good parallel passage would be Luke 19, 6, where we see Zacchaeus hurrying down um, the tree so that he can receive Jesus into his home. It's not hard to see that Martha had the heart of a servant. While her sister Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, Luke 10, 40 says that Martha was distracted with much serving. And in John 12, 2, after Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus had been raised from the dead, the Bible tells us that Martha was serving dinner with her brother Lazarus and Jesus was present. Now, this is my opinion. Sometimes I don't think we give Martha enough grace. And honestly, you know, when you read, most of us might read and think, why didn't she sit with her sister and hear what Jesus had to say? Jesus is far more important than any meal she could have prepared. Well, first of all, Martha was doing something that we are all commanded to do, and that show hospitality. And I won't read them all, but I did um, jot down some hospitality verses. You have Hebrews 13, 2. There's 1 Peter 4, 9. Uh, Romans 12, 13, Matthew 25, 30, 34 through 46, and 1 Timothy 5, through, or 5, 10. And that's just to name a, f a few, excuse me. <clears throat> Secondly, this wasn't just some random individual. This was Jesus. This was the Son of God. When, you're, when you host a gathering or event of some sort at your home, how often as the hostess do you really get to sit down and enjoy the company you've invited over. We want to make sure everyone has everything they need. We are always asking, what else do you need? Or can I get you some more to drink? Can I make you another plate? We want to make sure our guests are well taken care of. They want for nothing. And above all, we want to make, make them feel comfortable. And I believe that most of us, whether we know it or not, are more like Martha than we think. Martha wasn't being rude when she told Jesus to tell Mary to help her. She thought she was doing what was right. And initially, she was. But I think the struggle for Martha was she didn't understand how to balance it all. How can I listen to what Jesus has to say if I'm constantly taking care of someone else? Or if I have a test to study for? I am a mom, and so there's always a dinner that has to be, um, be prepped, or there's laundry that has to be done, somebody needs help with homework, you know. Our lives, even at a young age, are balancing acts. But even amid all the chaos, Jesus says to Martha and to us, I know life is busy, I know you have a lot going on, but Mary has chosen the good portion which is necessary, and it will not be taken away from her, Luke 10, 41 through 42. Really quick, Look at Psalm 16 and verse 5. It reads, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. That's the CSB. If you have the ESV, it'll say, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. Now, look at verse 2. 
I say to you, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The good portion that Jesus tells us and Martha that Mary has chosen is him. He is the good portion. Mary chose Jesus above everything else. And the psalmist and Jesus both tell us that Jesus is our inheritance. He is what we always need. And once we realize this, he can't be taken away from us. And we won't allow anything or anyone to persuade us that there is something better because there isn't. The psalmist said, if we don't have Jesus, we have nothing good. So now that we've just done this brief character study of Jesus, Martha, and Mary, the question is, how do we take the lives of Jesus, Mary, and Martha and apply their examples so that we can flourish as disciples and find balance in this busy world? The first point would be, follow the example of Jesus. Earlier, when we looked at Jesus as the busy Savior, we noticed that he was no stranger to always being needed. Very rarely did he have time for himself. I believe it would be wise for us to take the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and study and zoom in on how each writer focused on Jesus' life and his ministry and see how he balanced his day-to-day life. Yes, Jesus is God. But when he came to earth, he was fully human, just like we are. Philippians 2, 7, Hebrews 4, 15, which also means he understood what it was like to be overwhelmed and tired. Mark or Matthew 8, 24, John 4, 6. And where do we even begin to look when it comes to Jesus serving others? For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. Jesus has commanded all of us to eventually become teachers. Have we made the time to teach someone who doesn't know Jesus or stepped outside of our comfort zone and had that conversation with our closest friend? Maybe as we continue to grow in the Bible, we can start a small Bible study session with some of our peers. Um, I'm sure that there are some ladies um, who would love to help the younger ladies achieve something like that. We're all learning and growing, so we should be willing and want to do it together. Jesus set the example of being a friend, and we must follow him, John 15, 14. Friends keep us encouraged and accountable, Proverbs 27, 17. Friends are there for us in the best of times and the worst of times, Romans 12, 15. And I'll be the first to tell you, making friends isn't the easiest thing to do, sometimes because we don't like rejection. We don't like being told no. But think about Jesus and all the people he encountered on a daily basis. Furthermore, he knew who was going to reject him, and he still taught and performed miracles for and in the presence of individuals who had no desire to obey him whatsoever. We have no idea if someone is going to reject our friendship or our evangelism efforts. So we have to first try. Jesus is the only person who could have said no to certain individuals because he knew the outcome, but he didn't. If Jesus can teach and make friends, then he obviously knows that there is some form of balance that we must find in our lives to make it work because we have to do it too. John 16, 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Point number two, drop everything. And that sounds a whole lot easier said than done. I know that it is for me sometimes. Look at Matthew 6, 33. Am I the only one flipping? (laughs) It just sounds that way. Sometimes you hear the pages, sometimes you don't. But Matthew 6.33 reads, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Mary understood this concept. She could have been helping Martha serve, but she knew the importance of spending time with Jesus. Mary prioritized what she knew to be important, and God blessed her for it. And often, like Martha, I think nothing else can be done until I finish this one task. I can't relax until I cleaned every part of the kitchen after dinner. 
and I have to throw the last load of clothes in the dryer because I definitely don't want to rewash them again. And then I look at the spot on the window and I got to just clean that really quick. It will, only take an, it will only take me a second, but of course I have to clean the window next to it because it would look ridiculous to have one spot free window and a spotted window. And amid all this stuff I think just has to be done now, I have made no time for Jesus. I have made no time to hear what he has to say to me through his word. Maybe you don't have a problem with dropping housework or homework, but what about extracurricular activities? Can we sometimes find ourselves dropping everything for our favorite hobby? We all have them, but when our hobbies become our main focus, we might need to drop them and instead pick up a new hobby for the kingdom of God. Write a card to the sick and shut in or write out birthday and anniversary cards. We can use our phones to call or send an encouraging text to someone we didn't see Sunday or Wednesday or someone we know who is going through a trying time. In order to flourish as Christians in this busy world, sometimes we have to drop our desires and pick up the spiritual. Maybe we're not as involved as we should or could be with God and his kingdom because we find hobbies and extracurricular activities to be more fun and interesting. We need to make sure we are, flir we are nourishing our minds spiritually, and sometimes that means dropping what we think we can't live without because Jesus is the only being we can't live without, Philippians 2.13. Like Mary, we have to put God first above everyone and everything because he is the foundation that we must stand on so that we can properly balance our lives and flourish for his glory. 1 Corinthians 3.11 reads, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we can take breaks to be with Jesus. If we want to be the best disciples we can for Christ while living in this busy world, it is imperative that we take breaks. Even a nine to five understands this. A boss on the job realizes that if I want my employee at their best, I need to give them a break. I don't know about y'all, but I need my lunch break. Like I have to be re-energized. I need a lunch break. And Jesus says the same thing to his children, Mark 6:31. In Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 30, it reads, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Jesus knows that we get tired. We saw that a few minutes ago. He got tired. But if we rely on him to give us strength, he will. It is not uncommon for me to hear ma, mommy, ma. And every now and then I'll get a decent question, like an actual good question that I'm kind of in the mood to answer. But, <laughs> but <laughs> most times the question is really about nothing. It's the most off the wall question you could ever think of. And I often look at my kids and I just really want to like examine their minds. Like what is going on in there on a regular basis? <laughs> what is happening? Um, and another thing is no matter where I go, they always find me. But from time to time, I have to tell my kids, you need to leave me alone for five minutes. I need time to think by myself without any distractions. And that's okay. In Mark 6, 31, Jesus tells his disciples, come away by yourself to a desolate place and rest a while after feeding the 5,000. And if you read on in that text, it pretty much says that the disciples were so busy taking care of other individuals that they didn't even have time to eat. And as I told y'all before, I have to take a break. I have to eat. And there is such a thing as a hangry mom. I am that mom. <laughs> Every break doesn't have to be super long, but it is wise for all of us to break away from people and pray. Ask God to give you strength to get through the remainder of your day or pray for peace of mind. 
Maybe your attitude isn't the best in that moment. Pray and ask God to help you fix it and to get your mind right. Maybe school is overwhelming. Maybe you feel there aren't enough hours in the day to do everything on your checklist. Ask God to help you with any and everything. He is always willing to help if you ask for help. Now, I don't know about y'all, but Google is my friend. If I need verses on a certain subject, I will Google that topic and usually get a list of about 100 verses depending on the topic. Google a Bible verse and meditate on it. Instead of complaining about this being the worst day ever or this being the longest day ever or this just seems like I'm never going to get anything on my checklist. Done. Thank God that he allowed us to see it. Lamentation 3, 22 through 23 reads, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Find God and good in every day he blesses you with. Realize that we rely on God every minute of the day, and we need to take time to be with him. Songs and hymns are made to encourage us. Instead of listening to music to get you hype and excited, listen to a hymn. Allow the words of Christians help us to get ready to flourish and shine in a sensic world and allow our minds to start the day encouraged with God in the forefront. Hymns remind us of who God is, what he has done for us, what he will do for us, and that we can't do without him. Every moment we take to be reminded that God is our salvation, we nourish our souls and allow the light of Christ to be seen through us. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 reads, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Point number four is serve others. And now I know, because I just talked about taking a break, this tip sounds a little hypocritical. But as humans, we love to be around other human beings and have new interactions. Harm and I, um, we met at Taco Bell. Oh, yes, a beautiful love story. Um, <laughs> we met at Taco Bell, and... Although I did not like that job because you'd be surprised about how many people get upset over their 99 cent taco. It's a whole ordeal. But one of the things that I love the most about working at Taco Bell was the people that I encountered daily on a daily basis. Sometimes when I was working the drive through window, I mean, we have speed, so we kind of need you to go. But people would love to just have a whole conversation with me. And within those couple of minutes between me passing out bean burritos and Pepsis, I learned quite a bit about an individual that I have never met before and probably will never see again. And even the employees, and I have a great respect for, and I'm sure all of, all of us do because we're Christians, but I really do have a great respect for fast food employees because I understand how hard that job can be. People get really upset when their food isn't right. And I just said I get hangry, so I'm probably a Pharisee in that regard. But when we would get individuals that would come and they would, um, they would be hired, they would be, there would be people from all walks of life. We've met individuals who have had their own businesses, and unfortunately, life got hard. And they had to let their business go, and now they're working at Taco Bell. We've met individuals who, you know, are just passing through like Hiram and I were, you know. I'm working this job. I'm trying to save money, trying to put ourselves through school. But we have bigger dreams. We have more plans that we want to do. You never know who you encounter. But I, that's, that's what I loved most about working at Taco Bell was the fact that I met people from all walks of life. And no one person, no two people had the same story. Every story was different, and it was just the best thing. It was just one of the most, it was one of the best things for me. Um, although Mary, I'm sorry, although Martha was rebuked for not realizing the good portion, and she seemed somewhat overwhelmed, it brought her joy to serve Jesus. If you look back at our text in Luke 10, 38, 
It says she welcomed Jesus into her home. She was happy and willing to serve him. When we invite people to sit with us or if we go out and serve the community, doesn't it make you feel good? You feel accomplished and proud of yourself for doing something for someone else. And that's okay. That's not a prideful thing. That's not a, that's not a boastful thing. But you feel good when you have the opportunity to do for somebody else. So many people go without daily, and it's a humbling thought to remember how much God has provided for you and me. Now, nothing good we have is because of what we have done, but because God in his infinite, infinite goodness has allowed us to prosper, Psalm 1-3. If you notice John 13, 1 through 3, and for time's sake, I, I won't read it, but I will paraphrase. Jesus is having the last Passover meal with his disciples before his betrayal, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. And Peter is so thrown off by Jesus' actions that he asks him, what are you doing? And proceeds to tell Jesus, you will never wash my feet. To which Jesus re responds and says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no inheritance with me. Jesus' point is this. If you are mine, you will serve others because I have come to serve. Mark 10, 45. You are to follow my example. 1 Peter 2, 21. And when you serve others, it is pleasing to me. Hebrews 13, 16. So how do we do that? We take the best of both worlds from Mary and Martha and we put it into practice. Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. And when we open our Bibles, we sit at the feet of Jesus as well. We gain knowledge on what it means to serve and what it looks like. Who are we to serve? Do we do it all the time or some of the time? Any knowledge that we gain while sitting at the feet of Jesus is useless if we don't do anything with it. Our learning needs to lead us to better serving. Next, we take the example of Jesus and Martha and use that one as well. If you all notice a visitor with children, greet them. Maybe even ask them if they want to sit and worship with you and your family. It's a, scary, it's a scary thing walking into a place you've never been before. But a warm welcome and a smile can make all the difference for you and the guest. And don't do it because you think you have to. Do it because God is pleased with you when you do. And we all want to make God happy with our actions and following his example. Maybe you can go on a visit with one of the ladies from your congregation or call someone who is unable to get out of the house anymore. James 1.27 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their infliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You know, if it's the Lord's will, one day we will all be a little more seasoned than we are now. And we pray that when we reach that point, the individuals that we share the hope of heaven with will not have forgotten about us. Receiving an out-of-the-blue card, text, or phone call from someone makes all of us feel good. It's nice to know that someone was thinking about and praying for us. Every time we read about an ill individual being brought to Jesus to be healed, he did it without hesitation. In Matthew 8, 2 through 3, a leper comes to Jesus and says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus says, I am willing, and immediately the man was healed. We don't have the power to heal, but we have the power to write a card, send a text, and visit. Widows have lost their earthly parents. Partners, I'm sorry. I don't know if that didn't look right. Widows have lost their earthly partners but they haven't lost their friends and family in Christ. The sick may have lost some of their health, but they haven't lost their friends and family in Christ. An orphan no longer has their God-given earthly parents, but they have their spiritual brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents, parents, cousins, and whatever other family member you want to lump into that category for all eternity. And together as a family, we can come together to make sure they are taken care of just as Jesus does for us every day. Lastly, we can add to this list those who are less fortunate. There is always a need that needs to be fulfilled, and if we have the opportunity to fulfill it, we should. 
Unfortunately, we don't have to look very far. Donating to the goodwill is a good deed, but flourishing in this busy world means I'm going to stop what I'm doing and make the sacrifice to be hands-on with someone else's need. I'm not going to rely on someone else because God is relying on me. In Mark 6, 30 through 44, Jesus wanted his disciples to get away to a desolate place and get some rest because they couldn't get, but they couldn't get away because of the people, as we noticed earlier. And later, after Jesus had been teaching into the late hour of the day, the disciples told Jesus to send the people away so that they could go eat. And Jesus said to his disciples, you feed them. The point to be made is this. If we know someone who has a need and we can fulfill it right then, make like Nike and just do it. Don't wait for someone else to do it. We should be the ones to handle it. Galatians 6.10 James 4.17 says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, for our fifth and final point, we can remember our reward. This topic of flourishing as a disciple in a busy world is one that has, it has challenged me in more ways than one. I'm not perfect, and I surely don't have this whole balancing situation figured out. But one thing we would all do well to remember is that everything we do throughout this lifetime is for the glory and honor of God. Every inconvenience, every sacrifice, every learning process is done to bring us closer to Christ. Jesus tells us in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 to take on his yoke. In other words, yes, we have a load to carry for his namesake. But if we remember that Jesus is carrying the load with us, if we remember that he is walking with us every step of the way, then what we do for him will always be seen as an honor and never a consequence. If everything we do on this side of life is to impress and be seen by others as spiritual, then we are, we are doing discipleship wrong and we misunderstand Jesus. Our reward is in heaven with the Father, not here on earth, Matthew 6, 1. We strive to flourish in this busy world so that God can have all the glory, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Because we love him for his sacrifice for us, 1 John 4, 4 19. And because we want to be with him for all eternity, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. We look at the way of the world and the beautiful aspects throughout it. We watch nature and think how amazing it is that this earth can flourish and thrive in such harsh conditions. I want you ladies, just I want to do a brief exercise with you. I want you ladies to look at your sisters around you. Just take the time to look at these ladies around you. And then later, I want you to look in the mirror and say, wow, how amazing is it that you and I can flourish and thrive in such harsh conditions with the help of God? Nature doesn't flourish by itself. God provides what is necessary. You and I don't flourish by our, ourselves. God provides us with what is necessary. He freely gave, his, gave us his son to follow and great examples like Mary and Martha. We look at our busy Savior, we look at studi studious Mary and overwhelmed Martha, and we find the balance in our own lives to mimic their examples and flourish. And in doing so, we keep the forefront of our minds, we keep in the forefront of our minds that the main key to balancing and flourishing in our discipleship starts with the foundation. We can't balance on shaky groundwork. I am originally from Florida, so I'm a city girl. But I am now living in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I'm not a farmer, and I don't know much about farming, but there's a lot of farming going on out, out, out there, and Bowling Green, Kentucky is a beautiful state, um, and I love flowers. I do. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> the only flowers I can keep alive are the artificial ones I order off of Amazon, um, but I do know that for any plant to thrive, it needs water sunlight, and good soil. I have tried to care for real plants, and I have made the mistake of overwatering them, not giving enough water, 
Sometimes I give it too much sunlight or not enough sunlight. It's a learning process for sure. And sometimes it is a tragic process for my plants. But one thing I know for sure is that if we desire to flourish as disciples of Christ, we can never overwater our spiritual nourishment. We can never have too much of the sun. We can never feed our soul with too much of his words. Plants thrive with good soil, and Christians shine bright and thrive in a busy world with an awesome God. Will you ladies pray with me? Our God and our Father in heaven, we love you, and we thank you so much for the many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have had together to be able to look at your life, the life of Mary, and the life of Martha, Lord. We pray that we will continue to examine their lives and mimic their examples. Allow us to always be ready and willing to sit at your feet, Lord. Also, always be ready and willing to serve others, Lord, but also help us to remember and know that we are only human and that we do have to take breaks. But we pray, Lord, that you will help us to find the balance in our lives, be able to help ourselves and to help others, Lord, to lead them to you and realize that the main key in our life to balance anything and in this busy world that we live in is to keep you first always, to keep you and your word first always, Lord, and to know that our our resting place eventually will all be with you and that everything and anything that we do in your name, Lord, is never in vain. We love you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for life. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.